right, so good to see you here. Glad that you're here in worship and hope that you've been enjoying the series that we're in called Discover You. Let's look at what the psalmist wrote, Psalm 139. He said, God, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So what the psalmist wrote about himself is also true of you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God has created you with a mixture of talents and strengths and gifts that is unique and that prepare you to step into the world and to do his work in a unique way. And what the psalmist says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, he looks at himself and he makes that declaration, I hope you can say about yourself. I hope you can say, God, I thank you that I am who I am, because when you made me, you did really good work. <laughs> That's true, and I hope you can believe that and claim that. So we're in this series, Discover You, and you know that we've said the whole point of this series is to discover who you are so you can discover how God wants to use you to make a difference in the world. And so we've been looking at some of the components that God has put together within you. Two weeks ago, we looked at you and your spiritual gifts. Last week, we looked at you and your heartfelt passion to make a difference in the world. Next week, we're going to look at some of your formative experiences and how they may have shaped you to do God's work. And this morning, we're going to look at two things, your natural abilities and your personality. So when we finish this morning, we will have looked like your spiritual gifts, your heartfelt passions, your abilities, and your personality. So let's jump into your natural abilities. We're going to be short here, but I don't want to overlook this because very often God uses your natural abilities, your skills, your natural talents in your calling and for you to do his work in the world. Now, there's some things that you do and they seem to come to you naturally, easily. You just seem to do them better than lots of people because that's how you're created. And you may think, well, that's not very spiritual, but it is. Very often, God's calling on your life will employ these natural abilities that he's given you. Not everybody has those same abilities. Ain't everything for everybody. I usually use better English than that, but I like putting it that way. Ain't everything for everybody. I have, uh, from time to time, laughed with y'all before at my lack of athletic ability. Um, I can laugh about it now. It was not fun growing up. It was frustrating. Because as a young boy, nobody loved sports more than I did, and almost nobody was worse at sports than I was. That's not a good combo. Now, I'm going to tell you about my athletic highlight. You notice I say one. I'm going to tell you about the highlight of my athletic career. You're going to be very impressed. I tell this often. I've told professional athletes this story, and they're very impressed, as you can imagine. So I'm 11 years old. Yep, that's where I topped out in my athletic career. <laughs> 11 years old, I'm playing Little League. And we are playing a very important game. Whoever wins this game plays for the city championship. And we are playing a team that we hate. Hate, hate, hate. We hate the players. We hate the coach. Most of all, we hate the coach's wife up in the stands. <laughs> Still would, except I've accepted Jesus, and all I have is love in my heart now. <laughs> so we're playing this team that we hate. We got a guy on second and third. The score is tied, and I'm up to bat. And it's a problem because I can't hit. I can't hit, I know I can't hit, everybody knows I can't. If I ever got a foul ball, my brother in the stands would call out, good tip, Rob, good tip. Now their coach makes a mistake, terrible mistake. He calls a timeout, he walks to his pitcher, I know what he's telling his pitcher, dude can't hit. Just put three over the plate, we're out of the inning, we'll be good. The mistake is it gave me time to go to my coach and I said, Mr. Bishop, do you want me to try to make him balk? Now, this is how bad I am. Mr. Bishop doesn't say, no, 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 Rob, don't do anything crazy. Just three swings. Just try to make contact. Who knows? Maybe something can happen. Mr. Bishop, do you want me to try to make him balk? Without a second's hesitation, he says, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I get up into the batter's box. The guy starts his windup. 
I step back, I say, just a minute. And I reach down and get some dirt on my hands. He stops his windup, ump calls a balk. Guy on second goes to third. Guy on third comes to home plate. I get my only RBI of the whole year. It counts. <laughs> it really does count. I promptly strike out, but we won the game. And for a brief moment on that baseball diamond in Texas City, Texas, I was a hero, fearfully and wonderfully made. <laughs> it's important to know what you're good at. Did I have athletic ability? No, but I had a natural talent for trickeration, and I knew that. <laughs> so you got to know what you're good at, what you're not good at, and don't try to spend all of your time at things you don't do well when God's given you natural gifts and abilities that he wants to use and employ. So in the Old Testament, you had people who were called to build the tabernacle and to build the temple. They were master craftsmen. They were skilled. They had natural talents and skills that they had developed, and they used those natural abilities to glorify God. In the same way, musicians in the Old Testament, they were called to inspire God's people to worship. They used natural talents just like our team does here. What about you? What are you good at? I'll share some examples of, of things I've run into recently. Last Tuesday morning at Quest, I'm talking with one of our members. He's really a brilliant financial mind, had a great career. He's been looking to do some kingdom work. He's been on a mission trip to Guatemala, not really his thing. That's okay. Ain't everything for everybody. But he was talking with a friend, and the friend said, well, some of my buddies and I, we've gotten involved in a very cool ministry right here in Montgomery County. It helps the homeless, helps people step out of poverty, and it's really been successful. They need someone to oversee their finances. So our guy met with him. He's now stepped into that position, and he's making certain that they do everything, not just legally, but according to the best accounting principles. And this is important. I mean, if you're using God's money for something, you better do it right. You better do it with integrity. And if you're running a ministry, you better make certain that every cent is used efficiently. And if you're asking people to give you money, they have every right to know that you are using it well and that you are a good steward of what they may give you. So he's he stepped in that position, making certain all of that's true. What I wish you could see was the smile on his face and hear the energy in his voice as he talked about being a part of that organization, not just what he's doing, but how great it is to be a part of something that's lifting people out of poverty, that's getting the homeless into homes and making a difference in their lives, a ministry that's sharing Jesus with people so they have not only hope in this world, but hope for the world to come. Now, he probably can't do some of the things that that ministry does. He may not be able to counsel people to go through those difficult times or tell them the steps they need to take, but he can make certain that that ministry has the resources it needs and that other people can do those things. Why? Because he has this natural ability, his skills that he's developed, and that's now part of God's calling in his life. We have a group of men in our church. They call themselves the geezers. We call them the old geezers. And uh, they're older men. Most of them are retired. And they love going into the homes of people who are poor and the elderly who can't make repairs that they need. And they step in and they do this work. They're sharing the love of Jesus in a very practical, very real way. Let me tell you one more. A few months ago, I was in an airport waiting on a flight, and I noticed a guy was talking on the phone, and he, he had a whole arm, sleeve of tattoos on his left arm. I've come to the conclusion I like tattoos, I just don't like most tattoos. Can you relate to that at all? Yeah. But I loved his. It was really well done. And it had a date, it had some religious imagery, it had some sports imagery. So he hangs up the phone, I walk up to him and say, hey, how are you doing? He says, fine. I said, tell me about your tattoos. People with tattoos, they all have a story. They like telling that story. Tell me about your tattoos. Well, that date, that was the day he accepted Jesus. That was the day he decided he would go back to his wife and ask for her forgiveness and ask her to give him another chance to be the man she deserved. The religious imagery, that was the cross. 
That's what had saved him. That's what had redeemed him and given him a second chance at life. And the sports imagery, he just always had loved sports. And when I asked him what he did, he told me a little bit about his work. But what he really told me about is how he now has in the past and is today mentoring underprivileged kids in basketball. He, he's not a big guy. He had a career, played some in college, but because of his size, never went further than that. But he loves basketball. And so he's using that, that skill, that ability to mentor underprivileged youth about how to play ball, about how to be a man, how not to make the mistakes he made, and how to follow Jesus. You see, you take a skill, you take a natural ability, and you connect it with a passion for others that are underprivileged, and you don't want them to make the mistakes you've made. And you have a powerful ministry in the name of Jesus that brings good into the lives of others. So what are you good at? Maybe art, drama, music, photography, legal skills, maybe um, medical skills. All of those things can come together. So when you think about your work that you're supposed to be doing in the world, look at your natural abilities and your skills and believe that very well may be a part of what God has for you to do. Now we're going to jump and spend the rest of our time talking about you and your personality. So since human beings have been human beings, we have tried to understand ourselves, and we've tried to understand those around us. And what we've discovered is that in some ways we are like everybody else, in some ways we're like some other people, And in other ways, we're not like anybody else at all. We're completely unique. And so we've tried to put this together, and out of this attempt to understand ourselves and others have come the idea of of personality types. And this goes way back in the second century BC. There was a physician by the name of Galen, and he came up with four different personality temperaments. He based his work on the insights of Hippocrates. And many of you probably have taken the Myers-Briggs personality test as 16 different boxes, different personality types that you may have been placed in. And most recently, there's been a resurgence in the Enneagram that has nine different categories or personalities that people are placed in. What's important to understand is that there's no bad personality. You may say, well, Rob, you didn't know my first husband. But, but that's not really a personality problem, that's a character problem. Because there's no personality that's good or bad, no personality that's more like Jesus or less like Jesus. That's a character issue. When we talk about personalities, we're talking about things like how do we process information? How do we connect best with other people? How do we communicate? What motivates us? How do we respond under pressure? And there are different ways, and people can be broken down into different categories, different personality types. The one that we're going to use for this morning and at the seminar that we're going to do this Saturday, now, we maxed out on that. We've opened it up some more, so if you tried to register and there wasn't a space, go back there. Just go to the woodlandsumc.org and click on the loft icon, and you'll find it. It's this Saturday. You'll be given a personality test, spiritual gifts test, and the other things that we've talked about There'll be some helps there to determine those as well. What we're going to use on Saturday, what we're going to use now, is a model called DISC, D-I-S-C. And DISC has two scales. One scale determines whether you are outgoing or reserved, and the other is whether you are people-oriented or task-oriented. Now, this is rather simple, but it can still be helpful, and I think this morning will help you. And what happens is, by where you fall on those two scales, it puts you in one of four quadrants. Now, you'll probably have traits of the other three quadrants as well, but you'll tend to fall in one place more than the other. So we're going to look at these four personality types. We're going to look at people in the Bible who had that personality type. And then we're going to look at what each type needs to think through as they think about the ministry that God might have for them. So let's look at the first. It's the D. Now, the D personality, uh, these people are outgoing and task-oriented. If you're a D, you're probably very direct, you're decisive, you can be a bit dominating, 
You like being in charge. You like making decisions. You're probably very competitive. You love winning. You hate losing. And you do not like showing up on Monday morning for a meeting at work and everybody's spending the first 15 minutes catching up and finding out what everybody did. That's what lunch is for. This is a meeting. We got work to do. Time's a waste. And I'm responsible for this. Let's make it happen right now. You know anybody like that? You live with anybody like that? A lot of fun, isn't it? Uh, so... Uh, I'm going to say good things about every personality type. Okay. The, who, who in the Bible falls into that category? I think that's where we find the Apostle Paul. So we've talked about him the last few weeks, all that he did for Christ, all the ways he suffered, all the ways he got down, all the ways he got back up and kept going. Nobody did more in the first century to spread the gospel. Now, if you're going to fault Paul at any place, it could be in how he related to a young man by the name of John Mark. So here's the story. So Paul and Barnabas are good friends. They decide they're going to go off on a missionary journey, share Christ with people who have never heard the good news. And they take this young man, we usually just call him Mark, they take Mark with them. And along the way in Pamphylia, we don't know why, Mark just decides he's had enough, he can't go on, and he heads home before the trip is over. So Paul and Barnabas, they continue their missionary journey. They come back to Jerusalem. And after a while, Paul says, you know, we ought to go back. Let's touch base with those churches that we started. Let's see how those new believers are doing and encourage them in the faith. Here's what happens. Acts 15. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas. Now, as I say, you might fault Paul for not giving Mark a second chance. And I will tell you this. Later, we find Mark visiting Paul in prison. And Paul is sending him off on a mission to represent himself. So the past was forgiven, forgotten. The two men were reconciled, and they began to work uh, together again. But, but you could fault Paul for not giving him an immediate second chance. But I don't think this is a character issue. I think this is a personality issue. See, if you're a D, it's like, we got important work to do. You know, if I'm Paul, I'm thinking, i got the most important work in the world to do. We're going off on a mission. We're going to be places we've never been. We're going to do things we've never done. We don't know what kind of hardships that we're going to face. And I am not going to sacrifice this mission because someone who hasn't proven capable in the past wants to come along this time. Now, you may not be able to relate to that, or you may understand it completely. If so, you're probably a D. You believe the mission is important. You can make up, you can love somebody, you can have dinner with them later, but when it comes to the mission, you want people that are going to pull their weight because other folks, God, are depending upon you. Now, if this is who you are, if you're a D, then you probably need to be in a place where you can make decisions, where you can set the tone, where you can take the lead. But you also probably need to, well, learn to relax a bit. You need to realize that people's feelings really matter. You need to realize that people are going to make contributions in different ways than you do. And you need to realize that you're going to get more done by helping people find their place and succeed than if you just shove off and do it all on your own. I think of some professional athletes that tried their hand at coaching. Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, Mike Singletary. These are high Ds. These are competitive, dominant, win, 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 that's what I do kind of people. And how'd it go when they coached other guys? Not good. Not good. They're coaching other professional successful athletes who were not as driven as they were. And it didn't go well for anybody. And none of them are coaching today. So if you're D, we need you. We need people who make decisions, set direction, and keep us on task. But just kind of uh, rub off the hard edges and realize that one of your tasks is helping other people succeed 
and make their contribution. So let's look at the second personality type, and that's the eyes. These people are also outgoing, but they are people oriented. These people are usually influential, impressive, they can be emotional, they're often creative. These are people, people. They like people, they like being liked. Um, these are the kind of people that uh, you leave a party at 2 a.m. and you're saying, my gosh, how did it get this late? I gotta go home and get to work in the morning. And they say, hey, who else do you think is up that we can call? You say, you say, what for? So we can go do something. Dude, we just did something. We were at a party till two. No, let's go do something. This will be fun. So these people are very much people people. They like being around people. They like impressing people. They kind of like the limelight a little bit. Not bad. Just telling you that's how they are. Now, who here in the Bible falls into that category? I think the other guy in the story we just looked at, Barnabas, I think we might put him here. If you know his story, you know that Barnabas was not his given name. His real name was Joseph. He was given the nickname Barnabas by the apostles. They looked at him, they looked at his life, at his ministry, how he impacted others, and they gave him the name Barnabas, which literally means the son of encouragement. If encouragement had a child, it would be this guy. The encourager. How cool would that be if that was your nickname? Hey, we need some help. Go get the encourager. Everybody knows who you're talking about. That's this dude right here. We, we seem encouraging a young church that's struggling, young believers that are trying to find their way. When Paul is converted on the Damascus Road from persecuting the church, and no other believer will trust him. It's a ruse. It's a fake. He's just saying that to get close to us so he'll find out where we are. We'll end up dead or in prison just like our friends. It's Barnabas who seeks him out, listens to his story, learns his heart, and connects him with the apostles. Paul, I'm sure, would have had a great ministry without Barnabas, but he might not have had the ministry that he did have without the encourager. As a matter of fact, on one occasion, Paul and Barnabas are on their missionary journey. A man's healed, and the Greeks that they are preaching to, they think their gods have come down in human form. And Paul, they believe, is the god Hermes. Barnabas, they believe, is the god Zeus. This is the god of sky and thunder! <laughs> the lightning bolts in his hands. So he's an impressive figure, an impactful figure who likes building people up. Great preacher, his real gift is helping people believe they're gifted, they're important, and they can succeed. Now, if this is you, you need to be in a ministry where you can impact lives, where you can influence people, where you can encourage people, where you can see that you're making a real difference. You do not want to be in a ministry that has a lot of administration. You don't want to be in a ministry that you have a lot of tasks, rote tasks that you perform over and over again. That will just kill your spirit. You need the limelight a little bit. That doesn't make you vain, but eyes can struggle with vanity. What you need to remember is what's most important, is not being seen, not impressing others, not being liked, but being faithful. And using your gifts and using your personality to bring people to a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. So those are eyes. Those are people who are outgoing and people-oriented. Let's look at C's now. These people are reserved and task-oriented. These people are usually very competent, very conscientious. They are analytical, they are logical, and they can be a bit skeptical. These people like doing things. They like doing things right, and they're very happy, usually, to work alone. I have a brother-in-law who fits into this category. He is an engineer, not surprisingly. And he has several patents, really bright guy. He once told me this. He says, I don't need much in a job. I just need people to tell me what to do, give me the resources, let me go into my office, shut the door, and get it done. Now, for some of you, that would be hell on earth, right? 
Your job is you get in that office, you shut that door, there's nothing but you, a computer, and some math formulas. Don't come out till you get it figured out. But for him, that's paradise. Okay? Ain't everything for everybody. And that's how he's wired. That's what works for him. Who might fall into this category in the Bible? Well, I, I would put Thomas there. We call him Doubting Thomas. You remember this story. Jesus has been resurrected. He appears to the disciples, but Thomas isn't with them. And they say, when Thomas shows up, they say, hey, good news. We've seen Jesus. He's alive. He's been resurrected. And Thomas says, not so fast. I got a problem with that. It doesn't make sense. And here's what he says, John 20, 25. He says, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Raised from the dead? Don't make sense, man. I don't know what you think you saw, but I'm not sure you saw what you think you saw. If I saw it, I wouldn't believe it. Not until I got my hands on it, ran some tests on it, proved it to myself. Now, he did have an appearance of Jesus in his life. He did fall on his knees. He confessed, my Lord and my God. And church history tells us that he took the gospel to India. And that's why so many people in South India have the last name Thomas. So Thomas is skeptical. He's analytical. And, and that's fine. We need people like that. And if you're this group, you, you need some kind of ministry where you can do things, where you can do things that make a difference, but you, you probably, you can get enough of people pretty quickly, right? I mean, people can be draining. They can be emotionally draining. They are not as logical as a math formula. They're not as easy to figure out as a theorem in physics. So if this is you, you don't need to feel bad that this is you. You do care about people. You do want to serve God. Just you have a way of doing it um, that may be different than others. You, you sees you are usually the unsung heroes in every organization. You're doing the stuff that other people cannot do. You don't get a lot of applause. You don't get put up in front of people and praised. You're doing things behind the scenes that allows other people to do what they do and to make an impact. The, the guy that I mentioned to you, the guy, the finance guy, who's the treasurer for the homeless ministry, that this is exactly what he's doing. Behind the scenes, making things possible for other people. And it's a great ministry. I would just encourage you to remember that you really are doing this for people. You're doing it for God, and you're doing it to make a difference in the lives of people. Do that, and it'll be more fulfilling for you. You are not a human doing, you're a human being. And if you can remember that your work is making a difference in the lives of people, you'll find what you do for God even more fulfilling. Now let's talk about the last category, the S. These people are reserved, but people-oriented. Uh, they are usually very stable. They usually have servant hearts. They like helping out. They like connecting with people, but not on a big scale, more one-on-one, -on -one, more small groups. Those of you who are sitting in the front rows here, chances are you are not an S, okay? You, you, you I, I know an S, and that S would never sit in the front row because, first of all, everybody else is distracting and plus, I might be seen on the screen. I don't like that. Uh, if you're in the front row, uh, you're not an S afraid that somebody's going to see you and you start waving hi when you're on the screen. So you like connecting with people, but one-on-one -on -one are in uh, small groups. Who would I put here? I think maybe Andrew. Now, if you remember Andrew, he was Peter's brother. Peter is an I. He's a big personality, inspirational. He likes talking to big groups of people. Not Andrew. We never see him talking to a big crowd. We see him in the crowd, talking to individuals one-on-one -on -one or a couple other people. And then he brings them to Jesus. See, I think it's very possible that these two brothers have the same spiritual gift, the gift of evangelism. Think what we talked about a few weeks ago. Same gift, but different passions, different personalities. The gift is expressed differently. So Peter, he stands up on the day of Pentecost in front of thousands of people, preaches a powerful sermon, 
And thousands of people are converted. That's a gift of evangelism. Andrew, he's the guy in the crowd meeting somebody and saying, hey, how are you doing? I'm Andrew. What's your name? What brings you here? Builds a relationship. And then he says, hey, can I introduce you to Jesus? Same gift, different personalities. It's really important that we have both. Big personalities that speak to big groups and people who do best one-on-one. When I was on the West Campus, the pastor of the West Campus, the First Methodist Church in Houston, there was a woman who was just like this. She would bring people up to me after the service and would say, "Uh, Rob, uh, this is uh, Mary, and I wanted her to meet you. Or these are the Jordans, and I wanted them to meet you. I finally asked, her, Darla, who are all these people that you bring to me? She said, oh, these are new people. It's their first time here. I said, well, how, how do you know that it's their first time here? She says, well, I just hang out in the atrium, and I just look for people who seem a little lost, like they don't know where they're supposed to go. I go up, and I introduce myself, and I ask them, are you guys new here? Do you have anybody to sit with? And if they say, yeah, we're new, I say, oh, well, good. Come sit with me. And then after the service, I know our pastor would love to meet you. I said, Darla, this is fantastic. I, I said, we got to make a video of this because you didn't, you didn't wait for us to say, hey, here's a ministry idea, or hey, we need somebody to do this. You just looked around, you saw a need, and you just stepped into it. This will be such an encouragement to our congregation. It'll just open everybody's eyes up. Just look for ways. Don't wait to be empowered. You, you, you're called by God just to reach out, see something, and make a difference. And uh, she said, oh, I, I, don't, I don't think I could do that. I said, why not? Well, being on the big screen, I don't... I said, no, 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 no. You know, it would, you, we would shoot in a little room. There would be you. There would be me asking you questions and a video guy. It would just be the three of us. Yeah, I, I don't think I'd be comfortable with that. Not if it's going to be, you know, up in front of everybody. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> you go up to complete strangers, introduce yourself, and start talking to them. That is a lot harder. Uh, no, I just couldn't. I could, not, I could not bribe her. I could not encourage her. I could not shame her into doing it. Why? Because she's an S and ain't everything for everybody. But she had a great ministry. And if you're an S, you can have a great ministry. You don't have to wish you were a bigger personality. Because so much of the work that God does in the world is one-on-one. One person meeting another person. One person listening to another person. One person loving another person. One person saying, hey, could I introduce you to Jesus? So whatever personality type you are, whatever natural abilities you may have, You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God did really good work when he made you. And I want you to discover you. I want you to claim you. And I want you to step out in the world. And under the guidance and with the power of the Holy Spirit, I want you to do you for the glory of God and for the good of those that he loves so much. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you that you give us gifts, spiritual gifts, natural abilities. You give us passions. You give us a personality. You've made us who we are. And I thank you for the people in this room, each one of them, fearfully and wonderfully made, each one made to make a difference. I pray, Father, that we would look at ourselves, understand ourselves, and ask you to guide us into that ministry, that calling, that way of making a difference that we were created for. Father, I just get a picture of everyone in this room stepping into their calling, the difference it would make in the world, the people that would be healed, the people that would be given hope, the people who would step out of poverty, the broken lives that would become whole, the lost souls that would be found. So, Lord, breathe into us your spirit of courage, your spirit of power, your spirit of confidence, that we can be who we are and we can be used in powerful ways.
do great things through us, through every one of us here. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.